When Jesus went up on Mount Tabor, as we heard in the gospel, to be brilliantly transformed, he took three of his apostles with him, Peter, James, and John. James and John were brothers. They were sons of Zebedee. It seemed like they were kind of preeminent among the apostles. But they kind of pulled a surprise on Jesus when one day they asked him, Lord, when you enter your kingdom, can we be one at your right hand and one at your left? And Jesus said, that's, that's not for me to decide. That's for, for my heavenly father to decide who's going to be next to me in eternity. But Peter or James and John had the nerve to ask Jesus that. As the Jews call that chutzpah, which means kind of inordinate nerve. And when the other apostles learned of what James and John had said to Jesus, what they had asked of him, they became really angry with the two of them. After all, sincere Christians are supposed to, to have thoughts, not to have thoughts of personal ambition. Remember Jesus' words on an earlier occasion. He said, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny his very self before taking up his cross to follow me. So what James and John did was the exact opposite of what Jesus asked of his followers. And this is why it's so interesting to note Jesus' response to the action of the two brothers. He really didn't rebuke them for their request. He didn't even criticize them for wanting to be important. He simply called the whole group of apostles together and explained to them how greatness and importance are achieved. What he laid on them was one of the most revolutionary statements the world has ever heard. Jesus told them, anyone among you who aspires to greatness must serve the rest, and whoever wants to rank first among you must serve the needs of all. No more radical an idea has ever emerged in the thinking of the human race. We find it difficult to put into practice, but in our finest hours, we know those words of Jesus were certainly true. If you ever thought about how strange it is that Jesus himself, the Son of God, is considered to be the greatest person in all of human history, yet consider his background. He was a nobody from a carpenter shop in the little village of Nazareth. He had no wealth or possessions. He never held any high political office. He was hated by the, uh, the establishment at the time, and ultimately, he died like a criminal on the cross. Yet he is revered, revered as the greatest person who ever lived. How can that be? I guess what we're dealing with here is a stubborn truth to which all history ultimately bears witness. Greatness will finally be measured in terms of how you do what you do. Anything else is simply a chief substitute. I'm reminded of the life of Father Pete Grabaskus, who is a priest of the diocese here. Uh, he was ordained probably 10 or 12 years before I was. But I remember Pete as a young priest, very athletic, loved to play basketball with the young young fellows in the parish. And then one day, he was struck with a debilitating disease that just kind of sapped everything out of him. And at first, well, he was stationed at Mount Vernon St. Vincent's at the time. And at that point, the, the sisters operated a hospital at Mount Vernon. So they took Father Pete to the hospital, and at first he could they put a board on his chest, and he could struggle with his hands to offer Mass. 
but in short order, he couldn't even lift his arms to say mass. And so Father Pete spent the rest of his life, a number of years, just lying in bed. And, and 